What's good everybody? I'm Keandre. This is Hoopin' the Leg and welcome back to the channel. Now, Selection Sunday just passed and the field is set, so I wanted to get another board out there before we got into everything in March Madness this week. And if you are interested in joining the ESPN Bracket Challenge group this year, there is a link in the description to that. So if you want to see if you can do better than me, I know I did pretty good two years ago. I think I struggled last year. But yeah, if you're interested in that, definitely go uh, check that out because whoever does get first place will get a prize. Uh, as we've done the last couple years. But be sure to leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already, and we'll go ahead and get into some of those outside of the top 60 and a few of those guys to watch in March Madness. Now, both Bub Carrington and Colin Murray Boyles have recently stated that they plan on returning to college for their sophomore seasons, which I think is smart for both of them. But if that changes, then it very well could, especially for CMB, given he has the tournament stage in front of him, they'll probably be in my first round somewhere. But regardless, both are still super young and could compete for a lot of spots next year, even in a more top heavy 2025 class. It feels like Tyrese Proctor might return, but he's another one that if he doesn't, he will definitely be on here somewhere and then Hansen Young may not be eligible to come over contractually according to Rafael Barlow of the NBA draft big board but Young would be on here otherwise this time so we'll see what happens there and then I know a lot of people have asked about Terrence Shannon Jr. he's been a first round caliber talent this year but there's obvious reasons he hasn't been included on the board now I'm not implying anything that's not my job but when you have an outstanding charge of that magnitude I personally prefer to wait until that's resolved so that's what I'm going to continue to do and it'll be the first thing a lot of teams consider when they get closer to the combine. And then there's plenty of other intriguing prospects on here and many in the 60s and 70s of my board that happen to be in the tournament. We've got guys like Cam Spencer, Zeke Mayo, Keisha Johnson, Emmanuel Miller, Jackson Robinson, Antonio Reeves, and then also we've got the others who didn't happen to make it or play internationally that will have varying levels of interest to team. But getting into the top 60, Washington State's Jalen Wells went from being at the D2 level and becoming an All-American there to a real NBA prospect down the stretch of this year. At 6'8", he can shoot it, he can handle it a bit and get to the pull-up and also has real abilities as the defender on the ball. I still want to kind of see everything more and consistently in a few areas, but he's got the perfect opportunity to showcase his game in a tournament first against Tucker DeFreeze, and I think his stock could skyrocket from there. Drake's Tucker DeFreeze is going to have a perfect opportunity ahead of him to exercise his tournament demons from last year against Miami, this time against Washington State. He's a well-rounded sniper who has been dominant at the Missouri Valley level the last couple seasons. Now, those questions around his athleticism, the scalability, and on-ball defense will still be there, but he's got the game to overcome some of that in a real way. Tyon Grant Foster has a chance to really make a name in this tournament. He's been on the radar all year long, and a 6'7 wing who has as good an athlete and score as he is has to be mentioned. There are still some big questions medically, and with his age, that'll probably decide most of his future, but I think he's a pro, and I'm excited to see what he does and how far he can take this Grand Canyon team. I like Baylor's Jalen Bridges as a two-way guy in this class. He's a wing with size who brings it on defense and has shot the three really well this year. I think he just makes a lot of sense. Now, he is older and he's not really going to wow you in a ton of ways, but I think he belongs somewhere on the board. Arkansas's Trevor Brazil at least returned to the court in the last couple weeks and then against Bama and Vandy looked like the guy we've been waiting to see. Now, he's dealt with injuries all year long and the health is a big reason why he's not higher on my board but still there's appeal there as a forward who can shoot the three and provide some help at the rim. Colorado State's Nick Clifford was already going to make his first appearance on the board, but last night's first four matchup against Virginia only validated that placement here. When you don't really make an impact for three years and then transfer and break out as a senior, it does make me nervous, but when I watch Clifford play, I can't help but like his game. He's a powerful wing at 6'5", 6'6", who can really defend on and off the ball, and can shoot the three, and just projects well as a complimentary piece. Pre-draft, and if they can extend this tournament run any further, is going to be huge for him, but I wouldn't be completely shocked if a Ben Shepard-like rise was in the cards for him. Jamal Shedd has been one of the best players in the country this year for one of the tournament favorites in Houston, and even at 6'1", he has NBA appeal as a gritty defensive guard who is a real playmaker, and also happens to have the fourth highest BPM of any player 6'3 or shorter, trailing just Steph Curry, Ty Lawson, and Mario Chalmers. Robert 
Hawks tried to get it. Shaq for the win! Janai Broom has been impressively productive even dating back to his days at Moorhead State. Though he's not the most fleet of foot, he does hold his own defensively in a lot of spots and moves around and comes up with a good number of blocks. I know some who like him as high as the first round, I'll probably need to revisit to get there, but he's a definite good basketball player at the least. I've grown to be a bigger fan of Coleman Hawkins over the course of the year. I just think a four man who moves, shoots, passes, and defends as well as he does has to be drafted. I feel like I've kind of focused on what he isn't great at or where he doesn't fit into positionally in the past, but he gets the job done in so many other ways and would be one of my picks to be a riser to come out of this tournament for Illinois. Now the further we go, I find Ethano Monsa's game to be just a little more questionable in comparison to some of the other options. And he's someone I wish had just a few more pre-draft years to make it happen. He's still super young, he's versatile, he's effective around the rim, and has good feel on both ends, but he is a bit undersized, doesn't really have any elite traits in any one area. I still take him at a certain point, but I'm just a little bit more unsure of what the path looks like for him at this point. San Francisco's Jonathan Mogbo is hard not to be intrigued by as one of the class's best athletes and defenders. Now, the fit isn't the clearest at the NBA level given he's about 6'8 and is a 5 who doesn't shoot, but he moves so well and has such an intriguing feel and handle that I think there's something there that could be useful in the right situation. And if you haven't seen him yet this year, he'll be playing Cincinnati in the first round of the NIT, which should be a good game to watch. I was Peyton Sanford made a big impression on me as we got into about January and as he continued to put up big numbers even giving Penn State a triple double and drove to the rim a little bit more I felt he was definitely draftable now he does have some red flags individually defensively in my opinion but teams looking for shooting and size will certainly be interested in what he brings to the table Dive. watch the eye contact here boom Defender gets caught ball watching and dribble KJ Simpson was one of the best players in the Pac-12 this year and was a huge reason Colorado was able to sneak into the tournament the way that they did. He's got a lot to like as an all-around guard who is crafty, efficient, and a real leader. And even though he is a bit undersized, he's tough, just a good enough basketball player once again to potentially find a roster spot. I still like PJ Hall's game as a versatile big who can score inside and out and is a solid passer in a number of spots. We've talked about it before, he is a bit of a tweener in some ways. I don't know if he's necessarily quick enough to play the four and he went cold from three down the stretch, but I like what he brings. He plays hard and I think in the right situation he could really pop. In the absence of Tyler Kolek out with an injury, Cam Jones really stepped up and fully asserted himself as a prospect. He's been on the radar for a couple years, but he looks the part as a crafty scoring guard who gets to it in a number of ways and is a solid passer and defender as well. I think he has to be here somewhere and wouldn't be surprised if he continues to rise with every opportunity in the near future. Adem Bona earned first team all Pac-12 and defensive player of the year honors even in a weird year for UCLA. I'm fine with having him slotted here, but I still wouldn't be shocked if he outperforms where he is drafted, given his energy, athletic tools, and just the ability to cover ground on the defensive end. Now, there is still some egregious foul and decision making there at times, but I think he's a draftable prospect nonetheless. He's still a bit of a project, but Paco Dadier has maintained his stock as an athletic wing with upside as a shot maker and defender. Now, he hasn't put it all together this year, but he's had some really good moments in his opportunities against some other good prospects. And I think that initial interest is there for him to potentially further win teams over. Most of the season has been underwhelming for Kentucky's Justin Edwards, someone who was in number one pick talks to start the year, but the last month or so he's regained some of his stock and brought me more confidence that he could have an NBA role. He's got good size, he's a solid athlete, he's adjusting fairly well as a catch and shoot guy and has shown a little of the creation upside in some late clock situations. I don't know if I'll get back there, but I'd imagine he'll get some late first round looks from teams with a solid tourney and pre-draft run. A lot of the time I watch Harrison Ingram and feel like I should be even higher on him. He's a bit of an unorthodox player, but he's super effective as a combo forward who defends in multiple spots, rebounds with the best of them, and has shot the three ball much better this year. He's proven himself to be a potential contributor, and I would say he's the X factor for this UNC team trying to get back to the title game. 
I like Alex Carabin's potential as a plug and play prospect in this class. He's been a huge part of UConn staying a favorite to win back to back titles and a 6A forward who can shoot it, has the type of feel that he has and is a rock solid team defender, should have value across the board. I don't know how he didn't get a Big East award for the second straight year, but there's definitely bigger things ahead for him in spite of it. Baylor Shireman's combination of size, shooting, and playmaking should keep him a candidate to go as high as the early second round. He is older and not a great defensive prospect by any means, but I definitely think he can be a valuable piece and teams are always looking for what he brings, so archetype-wise, I'm sure he'll be high on lists. Melvin Agensa remains a solid prospect as a 3 and D athletic wing who has flashes as a shot maker. He hasn't shown too much else to this point this year, but he's still pretty young. He's contributing at a high level as a pro, and even with some of the inconsistencies there, I think he's worth an early second round selection at the least. And he'll have an opportunity to improve upon that at the Nike Hoop Summit coming up. I've still been surprised Jameer Watkins' name hasn't popped up more on the major boards out there, but I think that'll happen eventually. He's a talented wing defender who has an NBA body already, and he improved everywhere offensively. The jumper will be a swing skill for him, but if that's respectable and teams buy it, I think he contributes. So that's why he's as high as he is. For Trey Alexander has been a consistent force for Creighton the last several months of the season and he looks like a really solid early second round, late first round prospect. He's a big time shot maker who excels in the mid range and is more capable from three than the split show. He has big shots, he's solid defensively, he just happens to be a little bit smaller than you'd like and not a true initiator, but he's got a chance to show up big here in March Madness. That's exactly what John Gaffney is. Kim Christie may not be the most finished product and would probably maximize next year as he adds strength and improves as a driver and defender, but his ability to shoot the three and pull up off the bounce is elite and NBA material at that size. If I was betting on it, I'd probably put money on him returning another year, but if he was to declare, I'd consider him as early as the late first. Zach Eadie has pretty much won his second straight National Player of the Year award, which makes him the first to do it since Ralph Sampson in the 80s. There's nothing really new to learn about him. We know what's ultimately going to decide whether or not he can contribute in the league, but I am interested to see how he performs in March this year. I've always felt those post-up heavy teams are the easiest to game plan for and upset in these settings, but this supporting cast might be the best equipped to avoid another bad loss. Hello Larson is a top 40 player for me as a Swiss Army Knife wing who can defend in a couple spots and makes plays. The shot is still a big question, particularly volume wise, but I think he's a good bet as a rotation player if that all comes together. He's also a huge part of Arizona making a real run this year, so the ball is in his court to further his stock a little more in these next couple weeks. Weaver State's Dylan Jones has had himself a great college career, and you look at a game like he had against Northern Colorado going for nearly 30, 20, and 10 and making big plays to win the game in overtime, and it gives you some confidence that that level of productivity will figure things out. Now there's still some real questions in his three ball and how he makes that NBA adjustment to playing more off the ball than he ever has, but that's what the next couple months will be about for him, and I'm sure that's how he's approaching it. Of course, not much has changed with Oso Iguodaro. He's continued to be a big piece of this two-seeded Marquette team, and as for his NBA prospects, you always like a big who is as versatile as he is defensively and can also make plays for his team in a variety of ways and finish at the rim or on the short roll with his push shot or floater. And just given his skill set, I wouldn't be surprised if a team snags him just a little earlier than we expect either. Like we mentioned with Cam Jones, Tyler Kolek has been out with an oblique injury for the last several weeks, but he looks ready to go for the tournament and again, Marquette will need him to make the type of run that I think they can. NBA wise, he has appeal as a high level pick and roll playmaker and his reemergence as a shooter has been a big part of gaining first round interest. Now, there are some question marks physically and with him as a defender, but he's been one of those guys you never really want to bet against.
Bobby Clintman recently officially declared and should have a lot of interest from about 20 on in this draft. I've talked and seen a fair number of people who aren't necessarily big fans of his, but I like what he brings to the table, especially in this range. We recently dropped his scouting report, so go check that out if you haven't already for more detail on his game. He's been a draftable player for a couple years now, but Dayton's Deron Holmes put together one of the best seasons in college basketball this year and improved on some key areas along the way. He's got appeal as at least a rotational big who is versatile defensively and has the upside to both space the floor and serve as a play finisher around the rim. It wasn't the prettiest stretch run for Hannah Salas after the Duke game, but he had an objectively great season and showed he's a legitimate NBA prospect after a couple years in the background at Gonzaga. He's a big time shooter and scorer who competes on the defensive end nightly. I do worry about the smaller wings and this won't be the last time you hear me express that, but I think he's got enough to overcome it and potentially end up in the first round. AJ Mitchell's games against Northridge and Long Beach were some of the best performances I've seen from him and exactly what I've been looking for as he's battled some injuries. He's a super crafty guard with good feel and has shown that he can score all over the floor. The main questions will be in him up in that three point volume and then just some in him given the competition level and limited team success they had this year but I think he deserves real first round looks as he heads into the draft process. Jeremy McCain has been one of the most important players on this Duke roster this year and impressed with his consistency as a shooter, as a secondary playmaker, and with his solid defense. They still have some of the athletic and creation limitations there, but I think it'll be a good option as a guard next to bigger wing creators in the league, and he just knows how to play at the end of the day. Mitchell underneath. I've liked how Tristan Da Silva has played in the last month or so. He's been a bit more assertive from three, he's handled the ball well, made plays for others, and been moving about as well as I've seen him. Now there is still some questions in that athleticism, but he's got good size, feel, and I think he'll fit in a number of different spots at the next level. Keyshawn George is still one of the potential wild cards of this class to me. He didn't have quite the type of consistent impact you'd like to see down the stretch and went missing at times, but the appeal from a big guard or wing who is one of the better freshman shooters in the country and has the ability to connect the dots on both ends makes him a potential late first round option. The strength and athleticism are apparent roadblocks for him, especially as an older freshman, but he should have a lot of interest as he likely tests the waters at the very least. Virginia's Ryan Dunn finishes the season as one of the more one-sided prospects I've seen as an undeniably elite defender that makes sense in so many ways in the modern NBA, but he's also an absolute negative as a shooter and really struggled to even produce offensively down the stretch. The scout on him is pretty cut and dry at this point, so it's kind of up to your own and team's own interpretation on where to value him, but I still take the risk of picking him in the 20s in this class and try to get his offense and his shot together. At 6'7", Jalen Tyson's combination of creation, playmaking, and defense should be enough to keep him in first round conversations, even on a middling cow team. There is still some level of concern in the finishing and in playing more off the ball in the future, but he had a big time breakout season and showed an NBA skill set. Kevin McCullough was just announced as out with that knee injury for the NCAA tournament. It's an unfortunate end for him, especially for how much this Kansas team was going to need him to win any games, let alone make a run, but getting out of the season without making it worse was key for him in his long-term future. And I still like him as a defensive wing who is a good connected playmaker and shot and scored the ball a lot better this year. The season he's having. The case for Ignite's Tyler Smith remains a pretty easy one and I don't think we're going to learn too much else at this point considering pretty much everybody's sitting out right now, but a 6'10 forward who is absolutely one of the best shooters in the class, a consistent producer and efficient score inside has appeal. There are some fit and defensive questions there that keep me from joining those who have him in the lottery, but I think he can certainly contribute somewhere. I'm not 100% sure where I'll land on Tijon Salon just yet. I love the tools as a 6'9 forward who is super young, he's an impressive athlete and has shown a lot of upside as a straight line driver, cutter, and spot shooter. Now there is still a lot there to work on in terms of feel and consistency from play to play on both ends, but 
as much as I harp on that, he is still 18 until August, and this is his first year at this level, so that's got to be remembered. Nonetheless, somewhere from like 12 to 25 feels like it's going to be the sweet spot for him. Eve Misi has definitely been Baylor's best performing prospect for the last several months, and there's obvious appeal for him in that classic archetype as a rim protector and play finisher, but he's also shown he's capable of attacking a bit off the dribble from at least the top of the key or off of handoffs. Now, there are still a few touch questions in there, but I think he belongs at least in the conversation with those other bigs up here, and we'll have a lot of tournament tests ahead of him in terms of bigs if Baylor can at least win a game or two. I'm going to be very interested to see how teams evaluate and project Jacoby Walter in this draft. Even with his shooting splits taking a nosedive from three, I still buy him as one of the premier shooters around, especially off of movement, but it's mostly everything else that I'm concerned by. I've also had a hard time buying into the small wings just in my experience doing this the last few years, but Jacoby still remains someone I consider in the top 20. Devin Carter has become a legitimate top 20 prospect and even a lottery guy for some, continuing to showcase his skills as a high motor defensive guard at his core who has become a legitimate 3 point shooter and improved score along the way. He's one of those guys when you watch it's just hard not to love as a player and if you're a coach that's the person you want leading your team every night. I felt like Providence had a decent case to be in the tourney but that's how it works out sometimes. But he brought it every night and I'm confident he's gonna make some type of impact in the league. Johnny Furphy emerged as a real prospect this year, but it wouldn't shock me if he decided to return to Kansas. I'd still start to consider him as high as the late lottery as well, but given he's pretty exclusively an off-ball player that isn't an elite shooter and has some defensive questions still there, I'm a little undecided on just where to value that. It was an ugly loss against Nebraska in the last game of the Big Ten tourney for Indiana, but Kelo Ware really kind of put it all together in the last stretch of the season. Seven footer who moves as well as he does, can protect the rim, and has shown the type of upside as a score and floor spacer that he has aren't everywhere. I still have some of those motor and physicality questions at times when watching him, but I think Ware is a potential lottery pick, and I was impressed by how he battled in a year that wasn't going his team's way early. Seven to shoot now for Galloway, lob it up. Even with all the history saying most 23 year olds don't return lottery level value, I think Dalton Connect is a lottery pick in this class. He's been one of the most prolific college scorers in recent history, and it's not like we're talking about a small guard or someone with low level physical tools either. Now the defensive concerns are real, and I think that would be a better reason to fade him rather than relying on history of similar age players, but in the right context like an OKC or even a couple others kind of in that range, I think he could provide a lot of NBA value. Antonio Reeves at Kentucky and Mark Sears at Alabama tonight, Brew also in the conversation. Isaiah Collier's stretch run has likely earned him back a few fans in NBA organizations. He shot the ball better, he's taken better care of it while still being a dynamic playmaker and physical downhill threat. And while I do still think there are some big concerns with him defensively and just in his malleability fitting into some of these offenses with established playmakers, in a vacuum his talent is tough to deny. And he's someone I'll be curious to see how his pre-draft run goes because I think he's still got the potential to move around slightly without playing games. I've adjusted my thoughts on Donovan Klingon just slightly. I do still have some of those injury and conditioning concerns, but if that checks out, I think Klingon is pretty foolproof as a productive NBA player. He's one of the best rim protecting prospects in college basketball over the last couple years. He's got good size, he finishes well around the rim, and can do modern NBA big things on offense. And that's a combination that's tough to deny. It's not particularly exciting and he's not the most versatile guy, but it helps you win games and brings value in one of the most important areas in the league. Kyle Filipowski has asserted himself as a lottery pick and the biggest bright spot on a Duke team that has been somewhat frustrating this year. NBA wise, he still has some of those tweener questions there, but I've loved his progression as a defender. He's improved as a shooter and slightly at the rim, which is what we wanted to see. We'll see how much he'll be able to carry this Duke squad in the tournament with teams all the way keyed in on him, so it should be a fun challenge to watch.
He's dealt with injuries for a good portion of the season, so you don't want to stay too much in the moment, but the lack of impact Cody Williams has had recently is concerning. Now, I still think he belongs here, otherwise I just rank him lower, but the questions in his frame, handle, and shot make it a little bit tougher to sell him as a top five guy, but maybe I'll see that as being a little bit nearsighted, and again, he's got the opportunity to show out in attorney. Another UConn guy, Stefan Castle, has an opportunity to boost his stock about as much as anyone left out there. He's not the lead guard that we thought he could be coming in, but I've become really high on him as a wing defender and he's produced well in that connective wing role for this team. Serious questions are all on the shot and the assertiveness, especially given he's not an elite athlete. How you feel about that coming to fruition will swing your evaluation quite a bit, but again, he'll get the chance to show flashes at least with the basketball world's eyes all on his team. Nikola Topic is still yet to return and it feels like we're all a little uneasy, not because the injury is that serious, but with all the other top guards showing out the last two months and the questions that are still there with him, along with him making the move to the best league outside of the NBA, you just kind of want to see him out there. I'm somewhat torn because I still think he has some of the highest upside in the class as a big playmaking guard, but with the questions he has as a shooter and on defense, it's not quite as clear as I'd like it to keep him higher, but he could definitely get back and remains in the same sort of range. Reed Shepard has had some more eye-opening games against Mississippi State and Tennessee since the last board that we did, and heading into the tournament, he's gotten real consideration from some as the number one pick in this draft. Now, it's going to be hard for me to quite get to that point as a guard with underwhelming physical traits and at times questionable defense individually, but he's hard to deny as a good player when you watch him. I think he's going to be one of the most interesting prospects to track over the next several years, but at the end of the day, he is someone I'm confident will contribute in some fashion at the next level and has a little more as creator than is often talked about. And to his Kentucky backcourt mate Rob Dillingham, he has some of those same archetypal concerns with just how high you take guards of that stature and for Rob even more on the defensive end, but he's so dynamic as a shot maker with good upside as a passer as well that that risk might not matter as much if you're confident he can reach a certain level or if you just prefer that to what the other bigger options are giving you and I'm probably headed in that direction. You'll have an opportunity to be one of the stars of March and nail that home by putting together some more complete games rather than some of these five minute stretches and if this Kentucky team can collectively figure out how to guard somebody at the right time, it could be pretty historic. It's been clear for a while now that Modest Buzelis is far more interesting as a complimentary player than a real creator and I've started to find him a bit more appealing in the top five. He's a 6'9", 6'10", wing who can attack in straight lines, move without the ball, has decent upside as a passer long term and I actually like him quite a bit defensively, especially help side. Now the shot will be key for him in the end but I think the supporting pieces have been there enough consistently to make a real impact and he's produced well enough to be considered with his peers up here. Zachary Rizache has appeal as one of the top prospects in the class as a wing who has a good sample of effective shooting, is an intriguing mover, and has been solid defensively. Now he's been pretty mediocre at best as of late, and I think it's fair to question what he does when the shot isn't there, especially when we start talking number one, and when the creation questions are already built in, but for now, I think he's the type of complimentary player a lot of teams could use going forward. Chasing down from Rizache and the reverse. I am still somewhat surprised at how much higher on Ron Holland I am than the consensus right now, but I just think he belongs well in this group. Y'all know the pitch at this point, it's an athletic wing who gets to the rim as well as anyone, has a great motor and high defensive upside, and has developed in a significant way in his offensive skill set. Even with the questions in his three ball and some other things on the margins that we'll cover in his scouting report, I'd be pretty surprised if he dropped to the 10-11-12 range that he's often mocked at, and if he did, I think that'd be great value for that team. And as you probably guessed it, Alex Saar remains the number one guy for me. I've kind of left it up to the rest of this class to challenge him for this spot, but for me at least, there aren't any other prospects that make as much sense as him as the number one. He's a super versatile defender at the four of the five who can finish plays offensively, and if any of the flashes of shooting and scoring come to fruition and in any real way, I have a hard time believing he wouldn't end up the best guy in a borderline all-star at the least. I'll be doing his scouting report soon so we can get into detail about all this again but for some of those surface level reasons I mentioned he remains the top guy.
I appreciate y'all for watching this one. We've got some highly anticipated scatter reports coming in the next week or so, including Alex Sar. So definitely stay locked to the channel for that. And again, if you did want to join the bracket challenge, that link is in the description and I'll be tweeting throughout the tournament. So definitely go follow me over there if you haven't already. But that's all I've got for this one. If you enjoyed, please be sure to leave a like, subscribe if you are new to the channel and leave a comment down below of some guys that you think might rise most in the tournament. As always, I'm Keandre, this is Super Intellect. Until next time, I'm out.